صباح الخير من ثالث أيام قمة المعرفة في عامها الثالث ونأمل بأن ينال اليوم على إعجابكم ورضاكم أصحاب المعالي والسعادة السيدات والسادة الحضور الكريم تسعى كل جهة تمتلك المعرفة إلى استثمار تلك المعرفة في الارتقاء بمناحي الحياة ولعل أهم تلك المناحي هو المجال الصحي فالرعاية الصحية تاريخيا كان لها نصيب الأسد من البحث العلمي والزخم المعرفي نظرا لتأثير هذا القطاع الحيوي على حياة البشرية جمعاء عنوان هذه الجلسة المعرفة ومستقبل الصحة يختزل الارتباط المباشر بين المعرفة والصحة يتفضل بإدارة هذه الجلسة الدكتور جمال محمد الكعبي مدير قطاع التنمية الاجتماعية مكتب اللجنة التنفيذية تابع للمجلس التنفيذي لإمارة أبو ظبي Ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, welcome to day three of the Knowledge Summit 2016. All those who attain knowledge are bound to utilize it in improving the quality of the lives of others. Healthcare is perhaps the one domain that always benefited the most out of knowledge, given its importance to humanity without exception. The title of this session is Knowledge and the Future of Health, and it sums up the inseparable relation between knowledge and health. Please welcome the moderator for this session, Dr. Jamal al kabi Director of Social Development Sector at the Executive Council of Dubai. Your Excellency. Assalamu alaikum. ورحمة الله وبركاته أسعد الله صباحكم بكل خير ودائما مثل ما أقول صباحكم دبي وصباحكم قمة وصباحكم معرفة اليوم الثالث من قمة المعرفة وأتمنى إن شاء الله بما أننا بنكون في الجلسة الافتتاحية أن تحقق الفائدة المرجوة من هذه الجلسات وأن يكون مثل ما نقول ختامها مسك بإذن الله سبحانه وتعالى يسعدني ويشرفني أن أكون مدير هذه الجلسة وأتمنى أن تنال هذه الجلسة على رضاكم وتحقق الهدف المطلوب منها طبعا مستقبل الرعاية الصحية هو هاجس لكل الحكومات ما الذي سيحدث في السنوات القادمة بالنسبة للرعاية الصحية سواء عندنا هنا في دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة أم على مستوى العالم وكيف يمكن لنا نحن كجزء من هذا العالم أن نتفاعل مع المتغيرات المختلفة في النظام الصحي لو رجعنا للوراء لمدة خلنا نقول 20-30 سنة وخذنا زوم أن على قطاع الصحي في إمارة أو في دولة الإمارات ونقارن الوضع السابق بالوضع الحالي سنجد كثير من المتغيرات اختلفت يمكن اليوم نحن متجهين للطب في مجال تخصصي أكثر مما كان عليه في الوضع السابق صرنا ممكن نقول احنا الطب سيصبح مثل اللبس الذي سيفصل للشخص نفسه بحيث ان تقدم الرعاية الصحية كيس باي كيس يعني حالة لكل حالة وضعا في الاعتبار هذه المتغيرات ووضعا ايضا اين نريد ان نذهب لدينا اليوم مجموعة من الخبراء يمكن ان نستفيد من تجاربهم المختلفة في عملية استشراف المستقبل وكيف سيكون عليه واقع الحال لأن من تجاربهم أيضا في يوم الأيام أحدثوا تغييرات كبيرة وأحدثت نقلة نوعية في القطاع الصحي سنتحدث عنها بإسهاب بداية دعوني أعرفكم على متحدث الأول السيد دانيال كرافت وهو طبيب وعالم ومخترع ورائد أعمال ومبتكر تدرب ودرس في جامعة ستانفورد وهارفورد ويمتلك أكثر من عشرين سنة خبرة في ممارسة الطب والبحوث الطبية الحيوية والابتكار في مجال الرعاية الصحية وعندما نتحدث عن دانيال كرافت دائما يأتي إلى أذهاننا حديثه في التيد توك عن اختراعه المميز وهو جهاز المارو ماينر وأنا شخصيا أتذكر هذا الموضوع لأن في يوم الأيام كنت أعمل في قسم أمراض الدم والسرطان في مستشفى توام وكنت أعرف المعاناة اللي نعانيها في عملية استخراج خلايا نخاع العظم واليوم أنا سعيد جدا لوجود دانيال معانا 
كمخترع وأحدث نقلة نوعية وغير في مستقبل التشخيص وهذا الاختراع معتمد من الـ FDA وهو يتطلب الحد الأدنى من الجراحة تم اختيار دانيل كأحد القادة الأكثر إلهاما في مجال علوم الحياة ليس لدي المزيد للحديث عن دانيال أترك له المجال مستر دانيال دفلور جورج Great. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is my, I think, uh, third time to Dubai. Amazing place. Very inspired to see all the amazing technology and innovations that are coming here. And I've had some amazing friends and experiences in the past. Um, this morning, I want to briefly cover a little bit of a perspective about the future, the cutting edge and the future of health and medicine. Because technology, as you've seen all around us at this summit, and as, as is inspired and happens here, in Dubai is moving very quickly. And we can use some of these new technologies that are getting more and more powerful to cross the whole spectrum of healthcare, from helping keep us healthy, keeping pre prevention, uh, all the way to new ways of doing faster, less expensive diagnostics, more personalized therapy, uh, to democratize healthcare and bring healthcare to parts of the country and the world where it's not accessible, and even discovery, how we can all be part of the future of clinical trials as we, as we uh, move into this fast-paced world. Part of the challenge anywhere in the world is how do we think about medicine? It's really much more usually a sick care situation rather than health care. We're usually paying for treating disease after it happens. And part of that is because the information we get about our own bodies or the information that our doctors get is very intermittent. We get an occasional blood pressure check or EKG or you may be scribbling your notes of your blood pressure or your blood sugars and faxing them to your doctor. And because the data is so intermittent, we're quite reactive. We wait for the heart attack or the stroke or the lump to be discovered at late stage cancer. And as mentioned, I'm a cancer doctor. I'm tired of seeing patients who present at late stage disease. We want to be in this new future, um, not intermittent and reactive, but more continuous and proactive. And with the incredible new range of technologies coming together, I think we can start to connect these dots and bring us to a smarter future of health and medicine. The practice of medicine is also set to change. No longer will we be going to the doctor's office and waiting for an hour for that 12-minute visit, whether you're here, in Calcutta, in Abu Dhabi, anywhere. The models of, are changing about where we will access care. And in this new age, we can start to think differently about medicine, not just by body parts and subspecialties and silos. We have the opportunity to rethink the entire equation. So technology, which I'll focus on in a moment, is very important, but overlaying the technology piece, of course, are the incentives. And where I come from in the United States and most parts of the world, we still spend most of our healthcare dollars on the 20% of the population who already have advanced chronic diseases because we're often paid to treat. We're starting to see the equation shift to rewarding prevention, keeping people healthy, picking up disease at the very early stage. And that's often called value-based care. The way we pay for drugs, devices, interventions is all set to shift. And where healthcare happens is also changing with technology, no longer just in the hospital, the emergency room, the clinic. Increasingly, technology can take the doctor, blend them with the physician from the hospital to the home to the phone and bring uh, medical care almost anywhere. So we have a whole new suite of tools, obviously, in this new connected, mobile, digital age. Of course, we all have the smartphones in our pocket. We've only had smartphones like the iPhone for nine years. Think how different the world is nine years after the first iPhone. I actually found my, my old iPhone um, a few uh, weeks ago. It's in my pocket. It's an iPhone 2. It feels like an antique. At the time, it was brand new. It was magical. Now it feels old and small and, and low-powered. Imagine where these technologies will be in just two and five years. I actually, I, I come from Silicon Valley. I was at Apple headquarters. I have a sneak peek at the iPhone 10, And of course, here's the iPhone 11. Don't tell anybody, it's still a secret. But of course, <laughs> these technologies are becoming healthcare platforms and can connect the dots between doctors, patients, pharma, and beyond. And these technologies, like the smartphone, are riding this exponential wage, a age. You've heard of Moore's Law, the power of computing getting faster and faster, is an example of an exponential technology. And it's where exponentials happen, as we'll hear in the next session, that real change and real disruption is coming. So you need to get out of your linear mindset, 30 linear steps, and I'll be to the door, uh, 30 meters. If I took 30 exponential steps, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, I would be actually at a billion. That's 26 times around the planet. And that is the power of exponentials. 
that's coming to healthcare and many other fields. It's why the computer from 2000 fits on your, on your smartphone, now fits on your smartwatch, and now they're actually computers the size of a grain of rice, all of course which are starting to become connected. The internet of things coming to the internet of medical things as well. So with all these new technologies and connection coming, it's often called the new age of digital health or mobile health or connected health. I think we'll just soon call it health. We don't call it digital banking or digital movies. But in this new age of bringing information together, we do have the opportunity to reimagine healthcare and to change the equation from sick care to healthcare. Now, of course, it's not just Moore's Law that's moving faster. Many of the technologies you have here and, are, and you've seen in the, in the other talks from 3D printing, robotics, nanotechnology, AI, low-cost sensors, genomics are all coming together. They're converging and enabling us to address many of the challenges you have in healthcare, whether it's here in Dubai, in the UAE, or anywhere in the world. Rising costs, um, access to care, you know, in many remote areas, it's hard to access. We have lots of data now, lots of big data, but how do we make that useful information that you can use for yourself, for your children, for your parents? And then how do we take some of these new technologies and bring them to reality? The regulatory bodies, like the FDA, uh, are often challenged with how do you approve a new drug or an app? We can take inspiration from other innovators. Of course, you all know Uber. I took one here last night. Uber is an exponential company. They could not have existed 10 years ago. They did not invent the cell phone, GPS, online maps, online payments, or the, or the limo. They connected the dots. And they're even disrupting themselves now with building self-driving Ubers. I was in Pittsburgh last month, and I was right next to a self-driving Uber. So this Uberization is coming. It's also coming to healthcare. Uber themselves is helping deliver patients to hospitals and to clinics. They did a pilot trial where you would press a button on the app and a nurse would come to you to give you a flu shot. So we're starting to make healthcare a bit easier. There are now in, in the United States at least five Ubers for healthcare, press a button and a doctor comes to you. So these models are coming and they're gonna bring change to access and innovation. So I get a chance to look at the convergence of technologies at Singularity University. I've been the head of medicine since it started in 2009, founded by Peter Diamandis and Ray Kurzweil. And we look at the blending together of all these technologies and how we might use them, not just today, but in the next few years to address global challenges from poverty to education to healthcare. And because medicine is very interdisciplinary, I founded a conference called Exponential Medicine, where we bring together doctors, technologists, specialists, investors, and look at the cutting edge of medicine from many angles. Some, some of you might want to join us next fall in California at the Hotel Dell. Here in, in uh, Dubai, we have many uh, uh, graduates from Singularity University. Paul Epping, who is here, is our, is our local ambassador. So if you want to talk to Paul later, you can come and join other programs. Okay, quickly, let's look at some technologies and how they're affecting health and prevention. We know our genetics are important, but much more important for our long-term health are our behaviors. And we're now in an age where we can manage and understand our behaviors and how the bad behaviors, bad sleep, bad diet, stress, lead to most of our chronic conditions and lead to most of our costs. And we can start to measure them. I'm wearing four different devices on my wrist, you know, one from Philips, one from WeThings, an Apple Watch, a Fitbit. These are amazing five-year-old technologies which are starting to give us insights to our data. And we're moving from quantified self, just the data for yourself, to quantified health, where this information can flow from your wearables and your environment to your doctor, to your healthcare system, and make sense of it. In, in, the, in the United Kingdom, the NHS is starting to pay for these devices. They're prescribing and paying for glucometers and connected blood pressure cuffs and scales. And we can start to measure many things today, not just steps in sleep. We're in the era of not just wearables, but insideables. Google has developed a contact lens that can track your blood sugar for diabetic patients. And they're working with pharma to bring that to market in clinical trials today. That's an idea of an insideable. We're seeing devices that can live underneath our skin and can track our real-time blood sugar or potassium or blood oxygenation. So from wearables to insideables. Even to trainables. Just because you have information doesn't mean you're going to change. Many of us in this era of smartphones and computers don't have good posture. You can now wear this little device called the upright, put it on your, on your back one hour a day, and it dramatically improves your posture, buzzes your back, and gives you a clue to improve your posture. So small examples of connected devices changing behaviors. Or shockables, they can even make you change faster. Hearables, little hearing devices that play music but also can track your activity. Ringables, I'm wearing a ring right now that tracks my sleep, my heart rate, my activity. Lots of technologies packed into that. 
technologies to track the health of pregnant women and the fetus before they're even born. So all these things are becoming available to start to measure. You can even measure the quality of your breath. This is a, called the breathometer. It can track the quality of your breath, maybe start to pick up diseases like lung cancer or diabetes early just from your breath. So we can start to measure many things. And not just from devices we wear, our connected homes. Wi-Fi can be used to pick up the, the vital signs of up to 10 people in the same room. So we're entering an era where our digital health exhaust is going to be coming off our bodies 24-7, terabytes of data. The challenge is what do we do with that information? How do we use that to change our health and medicine? And just in 2016, we're starting to see the dots become connected with uh, Apple and Samsung. Data can flow through your wearables, your scale, your blood pressure cuff, your glucometer, through your smartphone, not just for you, but starting to go to your doctor. At Stanford now, I can connect the data from my phone right into my medical record. So we're starting to see the flow of information start to happen. So an apple a day keeps the doctor away may be actually true. Consumer companies are all starting to blend healthcare measurements and connectivity into their devices. Now, no one here wants to wear 10 devices and have 10 apps. We need to integrate this information in smart ways, kind of like a financial score. What about a health score? As we can see our score on our information, not just our vital signs, but our social network strength, our, our financial health, those all impact us in, in, in interesting ways. We can start to make predictions. Predictalytics. When is something about to change? How do you intervene early? Kind of like our modern cars. Our modern cars today have hundreds of sensors. You don't care about any one sensor. You care about when your check engine light goes on. And I think we'll start to see the check engine light of the body come together as we integrate information from our wearables and our connected homes. And even new companies like OnStar systems for the body that help give us a GPS, a guidance for our health and prevention. Daniel, go right to the gym, not left to the fast food restaurant as one example. But because behavior change is hard, we need new tools like coaches. You can talk to a real coach through your smartphone, digital coaching. There are now artificial intelligence coaches that can track your data and give you a chat bot and give you uh, uh, messaging to help you change whether it's preventing diabetes or managing a disease. You can talk through your smartphone and remind me that I have jet lag and that I should sleep earlier. We're seeing our connected homes have coaching. You might have seen uh, Amazon Echo or the Google Home. These will soon become healthcare devices. They can track your, your, your weight, your activity, remind you to take your medications, help you if you've fallen. So we're going to see a whole new set of connected smart homes use these technologies. Some of these coaches may be in your mirror. You look in the mirror every morning, you see you of today. Or you see you of tomorrow. If you can see you of tomorrow and how your, your, your behaviors and your diet and activity were impacting you. You of tomorrow if you're getting in shape or you of tomorrow if you keep eating too much. You know, a little, little challenge. Here's me before and after about 500 pastries. It can give you new incentives. And for folks who might smoke, before and after smoking, we can see the impacts of smoking on individuals. That, or too much time on Facebook. So these are examples of technologies in healthcare blending with augmented reality. Google Glass is a great example of a technology that's now being used by doctors in the operating room. Or the HoloLens device, the HoloLens device from Microsoft is being used to teach medical students anatomy or for surgeons to do procedures in, self, in safer, less invasive ways and to do medical simulation. We're seeing um, these technologies soon replacing our desktops and our computers. We'll just put on a virtual reality uh, headset and we'll be able to interact with our environment in many ways, from healthcare to finance and beyond. Virtual reality, of course, there's the expensive version, the low-cost version. These are being used to bring information to the doctor to synthesize data. We'll be using virtual reality as therapy. People who have a burn injury can put it, go into a cold environment and have their uh, pain scores go down. We're seeing these being used in the operating room to record surgeries for training or even live surgeries. I was in London six months ago, the first live stream virtual reality surgery. So these are new ways to educate uh, doctors, nurses around the planet. There are old technologies, of course, meditation and yoga. We can see the impact of them on our brain. There are technologies like brain-computer interfaces that you can buy today that help track your brain activity for meditation or to treat children with, who have attention deficit disorder, learning to focus. So these are ways of tracking our brains. We're seeing, in, in terms of health and wellness, using our genetics. Genomics is a whole fast-moving field. The price of sequencing an entire genome has dropped from a million dollars 
to thousands of dollars to about a thousand US dollars today. It's dropping at twice the rate of Moore's Law. You can have your entire genome done, comes with an app for about a thousand dollars. And we're starting to understand how to make sense of that and use that in the clinic. The microbiome, the bugs inside our bodies, play a role in everything from obesity to inflammatory bowel disease. And you can test your own microbiome, and we're seeing new therapies being developed on these. So whole new therapy realms to treat our microbiome. How about diagnosis? We want to get pick up disease early rather than late. We now have the opportunity to bring the diagnosis to you. A whole new set of diagnostic tools are becoming digitized. It might be a, a digital stethoscope, like the stethoscope in my pocket, uh, has the ability to uh, become digitized. A little attachment makes the sound digital, and the app itself will understand the heart sounds. These devices that used to take an entire clinic are shrunk to individual pocket-sized devices. So if you have a skin lesion, you can take a picture of that, send it to the dermatologist, they can do the, do the uh, therapy, or the artificial intelligence dermatologist will soon replace uh, and do a better job than traditional dermatologists. In the world of cardiology, we're, already, we're obviously the number one disease in most of the world, you can track with a little sensor on your phone your EKG. You can now track a patient with heart disease. Some of that can now be done on your smartwatch as well. So new ways to collect important data anywhere. I'm actually wearing a patch right now that's streaming my full-on EKG, my temperature, my heart rate, my position. That's a lot of data. How do we make sense of this and put it all together is a big challenge. Um, and if you do pick up a heart disease, instead of having the old-fashioned angiogram, we're now in an era of a virtual angiogram. A 30-second CT scan sent to the cloud can now diagnose if your blood vessels are narrow or not and personalize your therapy. So whole new ways of personalized diagnostics. Now, you might remember Star Trek and the tricorder. I've been involved in developing an actual tricorder. There's a $10 million prize to develop a medical tricorder. One of the teams I've helped mentor called Scanadu has developed a medical tricorder. You hold this to your forehead, it pulls down your temperature, your heart rate, your oxygen saturation, blood pressure, talks to your smartphone. You can check your urine, dip this in the urine, and your smartphone can pick up and analyze the signal and send that directly to your doctor. So diagnostics is coming to our homes and our pockets. And finally, of course, this is a lot of data. No way to keep sense of all this. So we're seeing artificial intelligence play a role in making sense of this information to guide you as an individual, your doctor, your healthcare system as we move forward. Of course, none of this technology replaces the physician or the doctor-patient relationship. I'm hopeful we can use these to augment these smart connections as we move forward. Okay, last two minutes. Therapy. We want therapy to be, be, be more tuned, more personalized, more specific. We're entering the true era of gene therapy. CRISPR technology is only four years old, but coming to the clinic to replace bad genes and put them in with good ones. This is going to cure diseases like sickle cell and thalassemia, and maybe even HIV. We're seeing low-cost RFID tablets that can track when you've taken a pill. So therapy is going to be more tracked. Some of these, instead of drugs and devices, we're going to prescribe electroceuticals, pacemakers, not just for your heart, but for your brain and for your gut. Um, we can have remote control contraception. Uh, we have connected uh, uh, EKGs and uh, uh, other devices. The challenge is there's a privacy issue. Who owns the data from these devices? Who controls it? I argue we should all own our own healthcare information. We're starting to prescribe for therapy apps, apps to help pregnancy, apps to help prevent people from coming back to the hospital by managing their information. For diabetes, a big issue here in the UAE, we're seeing apps being prescribed that can help just by using the information and adjusting medications and diet, lower average blood sugars. And the glucometers are getting less invasive, some that you can wear on your skin, some of them have social networks and coaches built into them. So tremendous opportunities to use this data in smarter ways and bring that digital checkup to you from wherever you might be. Virtual visits, telemedicine is already here. You're not usually seeing your doctor, but soon you will visit your physician, your nurse, through these sorts of platforms. And the way we interact won't just be on our smartphones. They'll be using these new connected technologies. Even chatbots today can do a great job of doing early uh, triage and diagnosis. You can use these on Facebook today. So maybe the first line of interaction will be with chatbots. Robotics, we'll hear more about that from, from Dr. Herr, is certainly playing a role in many parts of healthcare, from surgery to wearable exoskeletons uh, to enable folks to walk who are paralyzed. Parts of that device are 3D printed. 3D printing is coming to healthcare in very interesting ways, from replacing the old-fashioned cast to one that's 3D printed to match your own arm, to making your own hip and knee implant. There's so much medical tourism here with orthopedics. Soon we'll print 
your personalized hip and knee. One of our Singularity University companies sent the first 3D printer to the space station. You can even print a medical device on the space station. And we're starting to 3D print drugs to the point where you'll print your drug every morning at home based on what you need. Last point is discovery. We can all speed up the future of health and medicine, bringing it faster. We can reinvent clinical trials and using some of these new mobile and connected devices. In fact, today you can download clinical trials from Research Kit from Apple. It could be for autism, for Alzheimer's, for cardiovascular care. The app itself can make sense of that information and bring trials faster. So part of this future of health and medicine is to crowdsource it. Just like when we drive today with Google Maps or Waze, we can't imagine not driving with those now. We're crowdsourcing our own information. We can start to connect the dots and use that same crowdsourcing in healthcare to understand how to guide each individual patient. So let's not just be data donors and organ donors. Let's think about being data donors as well, connecting those dots, realizing that the world's moving exponentially. So you need to think about not where the technology is in 2016, but where it will be in 2018 and 2020. And think, of course, convergently, the overlap of AI, robotics, 3D printing, low-cost genomics, uh, uh, sensors, and beyond is where the future is being created. And there's no better place for that than here in Dubai to bring all these together and to think differently from our sick care equation today, intermittent, reactive, to a much more uh, continuous era, pro personalized, participatory, and proactive. And if we have that mindset, an exponential mindset, we can not only uh, predict the future, but go on to create it. And as Sheikh Mohammed says, we need to innovate or stagnate, and there's no better opportunity than in the future of health and medicine. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel. I think we will have so many questions about your presentation later on. Okay. Uh, لضيفي الثاني وهو السيد هيو هير وهو أستاذ مشارك في قسم وسائل الإعلام والفنون والعلوم وعلوم الصحة والتكنولوجيا في مختبر ومعهد الام اي تي أطلقت عليه هذا اللقب مجلة التايم نظرا لإنجازاته الثورية في الأحياء الميكاترونية وهو حق العلمي جديد يدمج بين الخصائص الفيزيائية البشرية والميكانيكا الكهربائية طبعا ضيفي كما ترون فقد ساقيه وكان هو أو هذا السبب هو اللي حفزه على المضي قدما في اكتشافه وأن يحول إعاقة إلى تحدي ونتج عنه أن سهل على الكثير الآن مسألة الركض ومسألة الرقص وأيضا مسألة التسلق وهي أشياء نمتن إحنا كمجتمعات بشرية لإنجازات السيد هيو The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning. Thank you. As stated in the introduction, I'm an MIT scientist and engineer, but I don't build bridges or buildings, I build body parts. I'm standing before you supported by entirely synthetic means, uh, titanium, aluminum, carbon composite, silicone, a bunch of nuts and bolts from the knee down. But with Bionex, I'm, I'm freed from the shackles of disability. I can run, skip and dance, I can do whatever I want to do. Uh, with technology. So today I'm going to talk about this emerging field of Bionex. What is Bionex? It's the design of constructs, whether by cells and tissues or synthetics, that uh, intimately attach to the body or even implanted inside the body to extend human capability, either to bring humans up to a normal innate capability or to extend humans beyond um, what nature intended. Uh, ironically, we understand uh, synthetics more than the cells and tissues in our bodies. Years ago with my colleague Bob Dennis, we built an actin-myosin machine, a swimming robot powered by living muscle tissue. This robot would swim through its own media comprising nutrients and oxygen. Because organ maintenance has not yet been perfected, our actinomyosin machine only lived for about 48 hours. But in the future, when we understand cells and tissues as deeply as we understand synthetics, when the architect 
designs and builds, she will inevitably ask, this part of the machine, should it be skin or should it be a polymer? This part of the machine, should it be uh, natural muscle tissue or shape memory alloy? Inevitably, at least for a class of machines, they'll be hybrid, part living and part non-living. And we will create in that new society a new nature. And that new nature will give us new bodies. So here you see the robot swimming through its media powered by living muscle tissue. So new bodies will eliminate disability in this century, eliminating uh, uh, blindness, for example, paralysis, severe depression, schizophrenia, uh, and also set the technological foundation for an enhanced human experience, extending human capability beyond innate physiology. So to march towards this future, I recently established the Center for Extreme Bionics at MIT. As, as David mentioned in the previous talk, what we're seeing in the field of me medicine is this incredible convergence of ways of thought, of disciplines. So represented in this, this center is expertise in genetics, tissue engineering, machine learning, robotics, nano, micro scale fabrication, and on and on and on. We have four programs to address and collapse and mitigate disability. The first is we want to understand and develop tools on how to get information in and out of the brain. Secondly, in and out of the body. Thirdly, we want to build body parts such as my legs out of mechatronics. And fourthly, we want to be able to repair and grow organs uh, using a regenerative cell culture process. So I'm going to go through each of these programs and give you a glimpse of some of the projects that are happening at MIT and around the world in this new arena of Binex. So getting information in and out of the central brain. The, the brain, human brain, is rather unimpressive externally. It's only a few pounds of uh, pink flesh, um, rather ugly uh, organ. But we all know when you look inside the brain, it uh, has ex ex extraordinary complexity, billions of cells, billions of connections between cells. What's not uh, broadly appreciated is there's many different types of cells in the brain that do different things and talk to their cell neighbors in different ways. And we largely, in the field of neuroscience, do not understand this complexity. So a challenge in this century is to deeply understand the human brain and also to develop tools to interface with the brain to, for the treatment of brain disorders. Largely, brain disorders are treated now with drugs pharmacological where we dope this very complex computer with a drug with often unfavorable side effects. But what the research community now is focused upon is achieving a way to interface with the brain that's very, very precise with incredible specificity where we can target individual cells. So to march towards this future of understanding the brain and re-engineering the brain, we, we have to develop a roadmap. We have to uh, understand the very structure of the brain not down to the nanoscale. This is expansion microscopy and invented by my colleague Edward Boyden. Um, Boyden, uh, when he was changing the diaper of his young child, thought of this idea of using the fundamental building blocks of diapers and built, embedding it into complex nervous tissue, adding water and expanding the tissue so that one can see the incredible uh, circuits um, with uh, standard imaging tools. So the initial goal here is to map the nervous system of a small animal and then eventually build up to mapping the whole nervous system of a large animal such as a human. So this will create a structural morphological mapping in the brain. But what about dynamics? So, so many of you may, perhaps have heard of the new field of optogenetics. By analogy, optogenetics uh, works as follows. Imagining if we could put small little solar panels on cell types in the brain or any tissue for which we want to turn on electrically. And then by shining light across the tissue, we, one could also turn that cell on electrically. This is basically what optogenetics does. 
So using a DNA strand from a single-celled algae and using a virus to target a cell type of interest in a brain or in some area of the nervous system, we can, uh, in effect, get a light-sensitive protein to express, and then by shining light on the nervous system, we can get uh, that particular cell type to express electrically. Uh, Boyden and others are developing implants that will go into the brain to deliver light, uh, electricity, to again re-engineer the brain to, for the treatment of various conditions. There's many applications to optogenetics. One of my favorite is the treatment of persons with seeing impairment. So these are, um, this is a mouse that's blind. The mouse, like uh, your kitty cat at home, does not like to be in water. So it's uh, trying to swim to and find dry land, and it's doing that by a brute force search. Because it's not able to see, it's feeling the walls of this maze. After the optogenetic treatment, where the bipolar cells were uh, targeted such that they express a light-sensitive protein, where an, as light enters the eye naturally, there's a conversion from light information to electrical information in the brain. Now the animal um, clearly can exploit visual information and swims directly into the channel. What's exciting is in the U.S., this strategy is, was recently approved by the FDA, and there's underway a human trial. Uh, so we're going to actually find out what human beings, uh, what they in fact perceive and see after this optogenetic treatment. Going on to uh, getting information in and out of the body, so for someone like myself with amputation, for decades, surface electrodes have been used to collect the electrical information from the peripheral system, from muscles. And then that signal has been decoded to control a robot. This technique does not work very well because as a person sweats and whatnot, the signal often degrades. Also, the electrodes are uncomfortable. So uh, at the Center for Extreme Bionics, we're exploiting the, fo the following biological phenomena. If you take a muscle M and a nerve N that's been cut, and you put them in close proximity, the nerve will grow and regenerate and attach to the end organ, the muscle, to innervate that muscle. This is a very robust, repeatable biological phenomena. You can even take skin cells next to a cutaneous nerve, and the cutaneous nerve will innervate the skin cells. You can even take a muscle that wants a nerve next to a cutaneous nerve and even th in that case the nerve will innervate uh, the end organ muscle. So the peripheral nervous system is very flexible, very plastic, very adaptable and we're exploiting that adaptability to develop interfaces to nerves so that bionic appendages can be controlled by the brain. So with microfabrication we're building these small uh, 100 micron channel uh, arrays and in the one end of the channel we put the transected nerve, the cut nerve. On the other end we put the skin and muscle cells of the patient being treated. The nerve then grows, regenerates through these small channels. Then with microfabbed electrodes in each channel we can bi-directionally signal from that uh, human nerve interface to any external machine. So this is an animation of a procedure that we're going to conduct uh, next year in volunteer patients. So here you see an amputated limb above the knee and transected nerves. We'll develop this microfab cap that will attach to the nerve. And then you see the, the red and white tissues, that's muscle and skin cells, that promotes growth of the nerve attaching to these end organs. Then we wire up the channels. That wiring then goes through a hole that we create in the bone. And then we, on the distal end of the bone, put a titanium shaft called an osseo implant. That shaft is hollow, and we run wires through the center of that shaft that go into an external bionic limb. We're now building this bit limb that will have a powered knee, ankle, subtalar joint, and metatarsal phalangeal joint. So four degrees of freedom. This will be the first demonstration of a nervous system control with both cutaneous and proprioceptive feedbacks. 
So that will begin next year, believe it or not. We just received funding. I heard two weeks ago that this project's funded, so I'm very, very excited. So that's amputation, thank you. What about paralysis? What about people that have biological limbs, but the limbs don't move in a natural way? So we, we have people in wheelchairs, and we, we also, as uh, David Kraft mentioned, there's now these emerging exoskeletons. So this lady that you see uh, has a spinal cord cut and wears a large exoskeleton. The only reason this exoskeleton is being worn is because the scientific field has yet to understand how to control living muscle tissue through artificial computation and stimulation. If we knew how to do that, this lovely lady would not have to wear this bulky exoskeleton. That's what we're thinking about at the center. How might that be possible? So we're doing, uh, first, we're implanting muscles with sensors to measure muscle length, speed, and force. Those wires from those sensors go through the skin membrane where the skin adheres to a synthetic conduit, creating a seal. Then on the external body, sitting on the skin is a very, very small button that has computation, where it basically is running a, a portion of the spinal cord, the circuits in the spinal cord that control for motion, a synthetic spinal cord that is running uh, reflexes and whatnot, um, what we know to be um, true of the spinal circuits. There'll be several of these buttons that wire up uh, muscles throughout the limb, and the buttons will talk to each other in a wireless communication. We'll build up an entire spinal cord with this capability. So sensors, um, how are we measuring muscle length? We're putting sonomicrometer crystals in muscles. So each muscle has two crystals. We pulse one crystal. A sound wave gets sent down the muscle and is received by its partner crystal. Uh, because we know the speed of sound through muscle, we know the distance between the crystals. And because we have a clock on our computer, we know also the time rate of change of that distance or velocity. Using a standard FDA-approved electrode uh, and a muscle model, we can also estimate uh, muscle. So with these sensors, we can measure muscle length, speed, and, and force. How do we actuate muscle? So again, I mentioned optogenetics previously. We're also using that technique in the peripheral system. So we inject the muscle for which we want to control with an opsin. And then, as shown on your right, um, the nerve that feeds that muscle expresses a light-sensitive protein, as shown here in small red dots. So this is a, a, a mouse that's under general anesthesia. There's nothing inside this mouse's body, nothing at all. We didn't put any implants in whatsoever. We simply injected the, the muscles of the mouse with, with this opsin and had the nerves express the light-sensitive protein. So by shining light on the skin, there's enough light that hits the nerve that we can get the nerve and the muscle to um, activate electrically, and we can control muscle with light. So again, there's nothing inside this animal. This is simply shining light on the skin, light of a particular wavelength. So we had wheelchairs, now we have these bulky exoskeletons. I think in the future, you won't see anything um, because there'll be tiny, tiny implants in the body and on the surface of the body that serve as synthetic, uh, artificial, synthetic uh, nervous systems that take over the control of our bodies. So moving on to mechatronic body parts, these are the limbs I'm wearing. Each limb has three computers and uh, 24 sensors. There's feedbacks that emulate lost muscle function. This restores capability in uh, people not only for flat surfaces, but very rough terrain. This is a person with bilateral amputation. Um, we're also building exoskeletons to augment capability, not just to bring people up to normal levels. So here's a person that suffered a stroke, um, and here's an exoskeleton that restores capability. In the future, again, we'll achieve this with light. So here he's walking, 
with a drought foot pathology. And then with an attached robot, um, we can mitigate disability, create symmetry between left and right sides and whatnot. In the realm of augmentation, um, this is the first exoskeleton that was ever built that augments human walking. So this person does not have any limb disability whatsoever. He has completely normal natural legs. This is a synthetic calf muscle enabling him to walk and run at faster speeds and lower metabolic energies. It's so profound in its augmentation that when you wear it for just 20 minutes, your own normal biological legs feel heavy and awkward. So I think in the future, when you walk down the streets of Dubai, you'll routinely see people wearing robots because they go faster, they want to be stronger, they want to protect their biological joints from high stresses. So I'll finish up with regenerative body parts. This is the work of Bob Langer at MIT and his many colleagues. This is a mouse where the spinal cord has been cut and of course you see significant paralysis in the hind limbs. What Bob's team have done is built a polymer scaffold, injected that scaffold with neural stem cells, uh, and they then promote uh, regrowth of the broken spinal cord. So you see here, after 90 days of regeneration of the spinal cord, a significant return of motor function in the hind limbs. What's very exciting is this recently went to a human trial. The FDA, however, did not allow for the neural stem cells, only for the polymer scaffold, but the pilot data are still very compelling. This gentleman would have been completely paralyzed by the waist, from the waist down, and now he has bowel function, he has basic walking patterns. So I think in two decades, we can largely solve paralysis by doing two things. One, repairing the spinal cord the best we can using regenerative medicine. And then secondly, using the digital nervous system that I described earlier, using light to control muscles to mitigate or eliminate the remaining uh, movement pathology. So I'll finish up with a comment on new identities. So you heard David's talk. Um, you heard the various examples that I provided in Binex. A lot is happening at a very fast pace in medicine. And you can, you can try to imagine what's going to be here in 50 years, 100 years. We can try to imagine it, but none of us can predict what's going to happen. We only know that it's going to be extraordinary and grand. And we're certain that every individual in that future world will have a plethora of ways, of technologies, of augmenting, enhancing their bodies, making themselves stronger, uh, more sentient, uh, greater cognitive abilities, enhanced emotions, etc. And in that world where we can literally sculpt our own bodies and minds, identity itself will be sculptable, malleable. So in the future, the designer will actually design himself. And, and there so, by doing, uh, modify or be able to manipulate his or her own identity. I've experienced this identity swapping in my own life. After my legs were amputated in a mountain climbing accident, I began hacking my own body, my own bionic limbs. Um, here I uh, adjusted my height, and I'm three meters high, able to reach anything that, I'm, that I want to reach. Um, through this in innovation and with my own body, by hacking my own body, I actually climbed better than I did with normal biological limbs. And I became a threat to my fellow climber. Uh, some of my climbing colleagues actually threatened to cut their own legs off to compete. Um, very, very serious. Uh, so I went from, this is a photograph that was taken shortly after my limbs were amputated in 1982. So most people, when they see such a photograph of a human being sitting on a bed uh, with both legs amputated, they view this image with pity, with regret. They, most people see weakness, they see powerlessness, they see a crippled person. I don't. In the, when I see this photograph, I see potential. Because what in the part of the body that's missing, we can use technology, we can use bionics to transform capability. So when I see this photograph, I see human potential. I see the potential of a transcendent capability, a transcendent human. So this narrative that I've experienced in my, with my own body and my own life, I think will play out across all 
human conditions and disabilities. Today, because of poor technology, uh, disability is very commonplace. But, but disability can be overcome, can be conquered through innovation and technology. You cannot, with a straight face, say that I'm disabled. I climb mountains, I run, I do whatever I want to do. But if you take the technology from my body, all I can do is crawl. But with technology, I'm freed from the shackles of disability. As we march across this century, this narrative will play out with every single condition that you see on this list, to the point where I strongly feel that we will uh, eliminate disability entirely from the world. So Bionics will augment the power of the mind, increase sensory experience, enhance our ability to learn and make us all uh, physically uh, superheroes. But uh, yes, indeed, Binex holds great promise for society, but not without risk. We need to, as a society, expand public policy and legal structures to anticipate and to deal with these emerging augmentation technologies. Yes, to further incentivize uh, augmentation techno technological development, but also to mitigate uh, detrimental uses of technology. It's not difficult to imagine a future world where parents, for example, will design their future children, their future offspring, where governments will control the mood of their citizens, and many other hard, brave new world scenarios. But I believe we can, as a society, eliminate disability in this century and as well as uh, adhere strictly to those great ideals, those fundamental ideals that we hold so dear, like individual freedoms and human diversity. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. أما الآن فمع ضيفنا الثالث البروفيسور محمد غنيم وهو أستاذ متفرغ في طب المسالك البولية بجامعة المنصورة بمصر درس في مصر وحصل على بكريوس طب الجراحة عام 1960 وحصل على درجة الدكتوراه الفخرية في الطب من جامعة جوتنبرغ السويدية عام 88 وعمل زميلا في جراحة المسالك البولية في مركز ميموريال سلون كيرتنج على السرطان بنيويورك حاز البروفيسور غنيم على العديد من الجوائز منها وسام فيليكس جوين من الجمعية الدولية لجراحة المسالك البولية وجائزة الرواد العرب من منظمة الفكر العربي وميدالية هاري سبينس من الرابطة الأمريكية لجراحين المسالك البولية والتناسلية وجائزة مبارك العلمية وجائزة الجمعية الطبية الأمريكية العربية وميدالية سان بول من جمعية المسالك البولية البريطانية رحبوا مع البروفيسور محمد غنيم Thank you, Dr. Gamal, my dear colleagues, Sayyidat wa Sayyidat al-Hudur. Thank you very much for inviting me to join you in this very important gathering. I do come from Egypt, but not from Cairo. Cairo is an urban disaster. I come from a smaller town in the northern part of the delta. The town is called Mansoura. And Mansoura literally means the victorious. And there are a good reason to name it Mansoura or the victorious. 800 years ago, the crusaders came to invade Egypt on their way to Jerusalem. They assembled a big army from Germany, France, and England, what we call now the NATO. So the NATO came to invade Egypt. And the commander-in-chief was King Louis the IX. 800 years ago, Egypt was strong. We could defeat the NATO. And we could capture, as a prisoner of war, the commander-in-chief, King Louis the IX. So Egypt was not only strong, but at the time, was civilized also. Where shall we put this important man? Shall we put him in Guantanamo or in Abu Ghraib? No, they put him in the house of the judge. 
of the city. Three months later, the Europeans gathered a big ransom of gold to liberate their king, collected lots of things. But with time, the Egyptian civilization decayed. And with decay, most of this money went back to European banks, unfortunately. A small amount of money remained in Mansoura, with which we built the urology and nephrology clinic, in which I am privileged to work in. <clears throat> I would like to share with you some important currently employed and potentially will be employed in the near future. In the horizon of medical applications. And I will focus on two important developments in basic science. Basic science is the drive, is the drive for developments in medicine, medicine engineering, etc. I will focus on two technologies or sciences nanotechnology and biotechnology. Nanotechnology, there is a group of people, Kada, the theoretical physicists. One of them, Richard Feynman, who won the Nobel Prize, he said that if the matter comes smaller and smaller to a scale which equals roughly, roughly, one over 50,000 of the human hair, the physical and chemical properties of this substance change. So if we imagine that we have a piece of chocolate, brown in color, nice taste, and if we divide it into 1,000 parts, it will remain brown and with a nice taste. But if we keep breaking it into this scale, the nanoscale, 150 over 50,000 in size, it may change color, it may be bitter, even it may be toxic. And th this is the basis of the nano science and nanotechnology. What would be the applications of nanotechnology in, medical, in medicine? <clears throat> Could be diagnosis, therapeutic, Implications, miniature constructions of an instrumentation, and I'll give you some examples of these potential applications. <clears throat> they could speed up diagnostic tests to be applied for screening of mass population, and for example, hepatitis C and B which are prevalent in our region, huh? could be diagnosed easily, simply, and at a larger scale. Nano gold particles are coated with an antibody against B or C. And when they are added to the blood specimen in the patient, the nano gold particles will adhere to the pathological cells, to the disease cells. But we cannot see the nano gold particles. They are too small to be seen by the naked eye. So if the sample is counter stained with silver, silver and gold will give a black color among positive patients. <clears throat> Professor Mustafa Sayed, working in Georgia Tech and in Egypt, and for many years have been trying, was trying to treat tumors, cancers, using nano gold particles. The idea to construct the nano, to have this construct, a center core of iron oxide surrounded by nano gold particles. And then at the periphery, the thing, the particle is coated with antibody against a given tumor or disease. So when these particles are administered to the body, the nano 
both the particles will go, will home to the required specific organ. How can we make sure that it really had homed into the specific site? Thanks to the iron oxide core and make an X-ray. Then if a laser beam is, <coughs> is uh, subjected to the area, the nanogold particles will be excited. They will have new properties. Their excitation will lead to the generation of intense heat that will lead to the destruction of the cancer cells. He had successfully treated or used it, this technology at the level of a small and intermediate animals. Nanotechnology had served to develop in the development of miniature instruments, thanks to the so-called nanoelectric circuits. We can now have nanoelectric circuits in the area of 10 nanos. We can, in a 10 nano, we can have a complete electric circuit. This technology had been applied for robotic surgery. Uh, this is the convention, conventional surgery that will disappear, in my opinion. Where a scalpel is made to make a big incision that is followed by an ugly scar. I think the robotic surgeons have been inspired by bullfighting. Where the assistants come in and insert several arrows into the back of the poor animal. And then will come the metador for the final kill. This is what happens in robotic surgery. The assistants will go into the operating room, insert four or five ports into the abdomen, for example, in this case, through which the instruments will be introduced. And then the metador come, which is the surgeon. The surgeon does not go into the operating room. He works outside. And through Wi-Fi technology, the orders are given to the instruments for action. But through the introduction of nano circuits, this was not enough. The surgical instruments became smaller and smaller. So as all of them could be inserted through one port instead of five. And this one, one port is inserted through the umbilicus. So there are no scars, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. This is a case that has been carried out in our hospital Half of the kidney was removed through one port, and this is the cosmetic appearance after three months. On the left-hand side, you can see an old hemodialysis machine. Now, there are efforts and experimentation and clinical trials, thanks to nanotechnology, miniature, miniature production of controls that we can have a wearable hemodialysis machine. And you can walk around while your, your blood is being detoxified from the poor elements. The second area where significant developments had occurred from the discovery of the DNA chain in the 50s towards the definition of the whole human genome late in the 90s and early 20s, things have evolved for the benefit of patients. <clears throat> Genomics, which is gene, entails two categories, gene therapy, you play with genes or gene editing, you rearrange the genes. Second, stem to chemistry. Third, stem cells. And a study in the biology of aging, studies to discover the mystery why we age. <clears throat> gene therapy. Now, donor cells. 
can be transfected with a gene. And this gene is responsible for the synthesis of factor 9. And when the patients are treated in this way, they have been cured from a serious disease, hemophilia B. Current efforts are to repeat the same exercise using a gene carrier carrying factor 8, responsible for the synthesis of factor 8 and the treatment of hemophilia type 8. Gene editing. In this experiment, very curious breakthrough experiment. Lymphocytes have been man manipulated with several genes were rearranged. And when these lymphocytes were inserted, administered to a baby with lymphoblastic leukemia, a killer, one year old baby. The modified cells, the cells that underwent genetic engineering, attacked the killer cells and cured this patient. The late Professor Ahmed Zouel was awarded the Nobel Prize for the introduction of the so-called fame to scale in time. And following this, he introduced the so-called the fame to scope, an instrument which can visualize particles in the nanoscale and register their motion in the picosecond scale. So this instrument was utilized to identify the abnormal proteins inside the cells of patients with Alzheimer's disease. If you identify the abnormal proteins, then the second step is to think of therapy through the so-called pharmaceutical engineering. I'm sure that one or more of his colleagues will continue this pioneering, very important work. Stem cells, now, now everybody speaks about stem cells. We, <clears throat> we can get them from various sources. sources. <clears throat> from the embryonic tissue, emb embryonic cells, neonatal tissues like the placenta, the umbilical cord, from other tissues like the mesenchymal stem cells. But one important source, a breakthrough in science, is called the induced pluripotent stem cells. What is the breakthrough? The Japanese investigators could successfully reverse human adult cells into the back to the embryonic status. Then we have embryonic-like cells. You take a sample from your skin, give it to the laboratory, and then they will convert it back to embryonic-like cells. And then you can do whatever you like with it in terms of differentiation into a cell, tissue, or organ. <clears throat> this pioneering work was awarded the Nobel Prize. It has two advantages, major advantages over embryonic cells. First, there are no concerns, concerns about any ethical problems. Second, they could be used in the autologous fashion, meaning that I take the cells from one patient, manipulate it in the laboratory, and give it back to the same patient without need, a need for immune suppression. What can we do with the stem cells? Either we convert a cell to another cell, functioning cell, or we make tissues, or an attempt to make whole organs from stem cells. In our laboratory in the Erosia and Nephrology Center in Mansoura, we have used stem cells that was obtained from bone marrow during hip surgery, whatever. We take them and grow them. They look like 
spindle shaped cells like this one. And through a, a series of maneuvers in culture media, these stem cells could, we could successfully differentiate them into insulin producing cells, which look green in color. The insulin dots inside the cytoplasm look green in color with this fluorescent microscope. We can even magnify the picture using confocal microscopy. This is one cell, nucleus in blue, and the insulin granules at the periphery, ready to go out to treat. We have successfully utilized this technology for treatment of experimentally induced diabetes in small animals, nude mice, and spread down the mice using encapsulated an encapsulated device. Now we are turning into a larger animal, the dog, before we go any further. But I must say that a group in California have already got an FDA approval for the treatment of type 1 diabetes using embryonic based embryonic from an embryonic cell line insulin producing cells. It's under trial now. The problem is in the, in the encapsulation. Anyway, we can make from cells, stem cells tissues. In this experiment, stem cells were utilized to <coughs> construct a tissue which resembles a urinary bladder. And experimentally was used to repair a defect of the urinary bladder in a, a dog. Organs. Now in, in uh, North Carolina, there are serious experimental work, serious. Not only to make cells or tissues, but whole organs, construct whole organs. Uh, this pioneering work is under the leadership of Professor Antti Atala, Antoni Atala. So, with the stem cells, we can do many things. There are se several exciting things that will be expected and implemented for the care of our patients. <clears throat> A big question, can we live longer? <coughs> Why don't we live longer? Can we live longer? There is one, several theories, but one important them, of them is called the damage so the telomere. The telomere is a specific area linked at the end of each of our chromosomes and is responsible for its integrity and health of the chromosome. In the middle panel, you see the telomere becomes long. Now became long. Under such conditions, the cells will divide faster and a tumor will develop. In the lower panel, if the telomere becomes shorter, this will cause cell death. And this is the theory of aging, telomere damage. Hmm? Oh, sorry. Why is the cause of telomere damage? One important cause is high calorie intake, which requires all these calories require high oxidative processes causes oxidative stress, which <clears throat> leads to mitochondrial damage. And the mitochondria are responsible for the synthesis of telomerase, which repairs the telomere. This repair does not occur, which will lead to telomere shorting with cell death. Can we overcome this one? Yeah, we can. By diet, exercise, and utilization of antioxidants. These are examples of some natural things which are fortunately abundant in our region and which are highly antioxidant. Pomegranate probably is the chief oranges, grapefruits, etc. But this is not the question. The question, can we live longer and be brighter 
be more intelligent, be more productive. A group from Harvard constructed a drug contents of which resemble the extracellular material in the brain, local hormones, etc. We call it Cognac, the miracle drug. It improves concentration. It enhances memory. It increases the IQ score. But the testimony was given by Stephen Hawking, the famous physicist. My brain is sharper than ever at the age of 70 using Cognac. We hope an FDA approval will come soon and we can live longer and brighter. Uh, what is, will happen in the Arab world? Many exciting things are coming up. We have heard them this morning from these two gentlemen. Shall we be always at the receiving end? Import, import to telephones, import to televisions, import drugs. Or shall we share with the humanity, give and take? Shall we share in discoveries, developments, and implementation? We can. If in our education there will be an emphasis on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and there should be generous funding or research. This is the way. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Thank you Professor Ghanem. <clears throat> Let me start the discussion. I think uh, the talks covered so many elements of uh, the healthcare. <clears throat> what is really important for us is the healthcare as a whole. Now, from the technology perspective, from improving the quality of life, from the uh, improving uh, uh, the aging process and so on of the humanity. How do you see, uh, Daniel, the future of the healthcare itself? I mean, do we need still to build hospitals or hospital will vanish? Uh, let's say, as a, a person, I will treat myself in the future. I don't need to have uh, a doctor. Everything will be uh, artificial intelligence and uh, I will get the, also the organ that fit my uh, measurement and so on. It will be delivered to my home. Data is available. Do you think this is happening or not? Parts of this are already happening. Again, there's no uh, one healthcare system. Uh, even in the United States, we have hundreds. Um, and it's not always about the technology, it's how you set the technologies together to integrate and set the incentives for individuals to have ownership of their own health information, to, uh, to be their own, uh, the CEO of their own health, as opposed to waiting to go to the doctor after disease happens. So I think we'll need less hospital beds because we'll spend more time uh, picking up disease early, mm. managing at home. Uh, you can have essentially an intensive care unit on a patch, like I showed you, to monitor some of this information. The role of the doctor is going to change to help the individual uh, understand their genetics, how to use that proactively to tune their prevention. Again, it's spending more time and energy on the health and prevention side, longevity, health span, not before you need the organ transplant or the dialysis. So there's a whole combination of these forces. The trick um, from the policy and the leadership and the education piece is to uh, give some of the power back to the individual and the ownership and responsibility to take care of themselves and not wait for disease to happen. Uh, and, but these changes, including needing less hospitals, using AI doctors, is disruptive. The current medical system often doesn't want to see these changes because it changes how they get paid. So we need to start to, to blend the incentives, paying do doctors, hospital systems to keep you healthy rather than for uh, the fancy transplant later in life. Do you think that the information we provide for patient is too much? Because right now, I, I, I receive so many questions because I have my own health show on TV, and they start doing genetic testing. It's too much information, and they don't know what to do about it. And whether uh, I do this or I do that, it's a decision making. They still need a doctor to, to consult them and to 
guide them. Uh, mobile application also providing too much information. Yeah. Is it, well, uh, are we going in the right direction or we will have some risk here? There's a risk of being overwhelmed by th alerts and nudges and apps. We need to start to think how to synthesize this. Like I mentioned, the, the check engine light in your car is, this, is the, the bringing together of lots of information about the health of your car. The same thing can happen for your individual health. And no doctor can keep up with the genetics uh, or all the new guidance. So we need to blend the machine learning, the AI, to present that in a synthesized form. So you don't look at your raw genes. You see, what does that gene mean about your risk for Parkinson's or diabetes? What drug might you take based on that. That needs to be part of the workflow of the doctor in their medical record. When they see you, they should have the genetic, genetic information and others in the background, your digital exhaust, all that synthesized so we can make sense of it. Because again, with this big data era, it can easily be overwhelming. We need to simplify it and make it more tuned to the person and to the uh, culture, the language, the age, so it's not one size fits all. Uh, I will go to... Uh, Regarding from your experience, the thing that here in UAE we have too much road traffic accident and most of the time it ends up with paralysis. How, how do you think uh, uh, putting the new technology that you provided will help? Also from the perspective of the cost. I know there is a huge debate regarding introducing technology to improve the quality of life versus also the cost of the technology itself, it's a burden on the government and sometimes uh, the community will not accept it or the government would say this is uh, it's a burden and it's better to focus on prevention, to educate, as we mentioned earlier. How, how do you see this in the future? Yeah, thank you for the questions. The first question related to um, paralysis um, due to typically spinal cord injury. So as I mentioned in my remarks earlier, um, I, I think the, uh, the winning approach in the future will be um, a two-stage procedure. First, to use regenerative medicine to repair um, the broken spinal cord. To the degree to which that is imperfect, that repair, to the degree to which there's still a motor or movement disorder, um, we can then build up um, artificial small little brains that take over the control of muscles to restore natural movement. So I think the combination of regenerative medicine and what I call a digital nervous system will ultimately um, eliminate paralysis. Um, the second question related to cost. Uh, you know, once, once these many extraordinary uh, medical interventions have been fully developed, once the research has been completed, the R&D, the translation to human patients, um, what we can think about globally is creating a geographically distributed fabrication capability. So Neil Gershenfeld at MIT has developed what he calls fab labs, very sophisticated fabrication uh, capabilities, and he's putting fab labs across the world. Uh, many times in very poor regions of the world and teaching the local community members how to use these very sophisticated fabrication tools. So we can imagine the future medical fab labs uh, where the local community is in charge of the design and the fabrication of their own medical treatments and devices. That will um, enable a customization of medical treatment given local cultures. It'll enable local employment and em em employment rates uh, to advance these technologies and dramatically drive down costs. So again, I think that, that geographically distribution of very sophisticated fabrication is, will ultimately be the key to lowering costs. Professor Ghanem, uh, diabetes is a public health issue here. How do you see the future of diabetes? There are two types of diabetes, as yeah. you know. There are two types of... Type 1, I think, is a serious condition. A young child receiving insulin 
as a result of autoimmune destruction of his beta cells. So, so he's receiving exogenous insulin. And this boy or girl going to the school, don't eat chocolates, huh? don't have a cola, and so. So kind of the fitness is exogenous insulin. If you go into renal failure, maybe the transplantation with a kidney and <clears throat> a whole pancreas or IL cell transplants, in this case, they have to receive immune suppression for life. But I, I'm telling you now that, in my opinion, between three and five, five years, type 1 diabetes will be treated with the stem cells, modified to form insulin. But these cells should be glucose sensitive. They should no, no, the level is high, the level is low. And they should be insulin responsive. Responsive. If the insulin, if the glucose is high, the insulin gets out, it's low, it stops. And I think there are three groups in America working, two in America and two in, in America and one in Canada. Working in California is the group working with embryonic stem cells. In Harvard, they are working with the so-called immune uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. And in Canada, they are using embryonic stem cells. Uh, we are uh, rather on a different level. We are using adult stem cells uh, from bone marrow. And we have discovered that the adult bone marrow cells or fat cells, fat cells, now lots of fat people got an aspirate. And the aspirate is put in the drain. Now, this full of stem cells, very useful. Other stem cells, we have, we can, we can differentiate them because they are a heterogeneous group of cells. We could separate the subpopulation of these cells. It's called SEA, SEA4 cells, embryonic-like cells from adult stem cells. I'm working with that. So I think within three or five years, huh, one of these groups, will provide a definitive treatment for type 1 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes, well, we have to first we emphasize on diet, emphasize on exercise, emphasis on exercise, medical treatment. And now, uh, it's coming up the bariatric surgery among obese diabetic patients, whereby uh, sleeve from the stomach is removed with a bypass and this will cure the disease type 2. Done. I was going to say because type 2 diabetes is really li a lifestyle issue based yes. on diet and lack of exercise. Um, it's easy to say exercise more and eat less but it's very difficult to always do that. So what we're starting to see is the idea of a digiceutical. Taking folks who are pre-diabetic, we can identify that their blood sugar is a little too high, their weight's a little too high. We can now use their genomics, their microbiome, their digital exhaust, to pick the right diet specifically for them, put them in a social network group where they have a step counter and a scale, and together with the social network and their data, we can turn them around from becoming pre-diabetic, prevent them from becoming diabetic, and save a lot of time, money, and sickness. So I think a lot of blending of our mobile digital tools along with sequencing and precision data is going to help us guide behavior and change before you get type 2 diabetes. You, you mentioned about uh, using uh, processes to help people improve their uh, fitness. Is it uh, something you see for obese people? Uh, I mean, sure. You can. Uh, I mean, you can view the the bicycle as an exoskeleton, and the bicycle has contributed to human human fitness. So what we need to do in, in these bipedal exoskeletal designs that make us stronger and more efficient and, and faster is make sure that the technology, the exoskeleton, doesn't do 100%. <laughs> um, that it's the motor capability is, is a collaboration, if you will, between the human body and the synthetic exoskeleton. And through that collaboration, there's an enhanced capability. But of you know, we all know if you don't use the body, 
um, the body will degrade. So that human-machine interaction um, is, is very important. Let's see how Dubai roads later on we'll see or the malls, people will use it or not. Uh, thank you for your discussion. Uh, if anyone has any question, here, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dr. Muhammad Khalifa, Director of the Shulq Al-Nayah Al-Hakum al-Dubai. In the beginning, I thank you for the number of the knowledge that we have used a lot. And in the fact, I have three questions very important. The first question is, please allow me to increase the knowledge of the knowledge of the knowledge of the knowledge. في ظل تطور الهائل في مجال الطب والجراحة وإمكانية تغيير الأعضاء هل يا ترى فيه وسائل جديدة ممكن نشوفها في مستقبل الإثبات الجنائي لا سيما بعد ما اكتشف بصمة المخ وبصمة العين وبصمة الأذن والدي إن إيه هل فيه وسائل جديدة أكثر من ذلك ممكن تظهر في في مجال الإثبات السؤال الثاني في ظل التطور الهائل في مجال التكنولوجيا الطبية هل من ضرورة لإيجاد إطار قانوني وتغيير قانوني للتشريعات والقوانين القائمة لمثل هذه التطورات لا سيما في ظل إمكانية تغيير أو القضاء على الشيخوخة وإطالة العمر وشركات التأمين والتأمين على الحياة السؤال الثالث استفسار بسيط هل في إمكانية أو في احتمالية لفرصة نحن نشوف في القريب العاجل فرصة أو وجود علاج سهل للأمراض المزمنة مثل السرطان أو الأمراض الجلدية المزمنة مثل البهاق أشكركم وإن شاء الله إن شاء الله نلقاكم بإذن الله شكرا So the legalization you, you I think uh, he will touch this regarding the need of some policy, right. some legal framework to accommodate all the different changes. And the second one is the chronic illness disease. Maybe Professor Ghanim can answer this question. Yes, so in viewing all, all three lectures, obviously there's extraordinary positive potential for humanity. Um, it's very obvious that in this 21st century, we will conquer, conquer so much disability and so much disease. So that's wonderful, but what we have to be careful of is unintended uses of these new treatments, these new technologies. So as we expand these various ways of modifying the human, redesign, redesigning human capability, we must also in a commensurate fashion expand public policy and legal structures around these novel interventions uh, to mitigate unintended, perhaps nefarious uses of new technology. Um, what are the extremes? The one extreme is we do nothing to mitigate unintended uses of technology. That would be inappropriate. Um, the other extreme is that we attempt to ban all research because we're so fearful of the unintended consequences. Clearly, we don't want to do that. So we need to be in the middle of those extremes. Um, we need to march forward and reduce human suffering, while at the same time, ad with absolute obedience, adhering to principles, human principles, that we hold so dear. We want to maintain individual freedoms or even expand individual freedoms. We want to maintain human diversity or even expand human diversity. We don't want to collapse basic human rights and basic levels of human diversity. One of the challenges with this is technology is moving so quickly, the policy and the ethics are often outpaced. So you can imagine with CRISPR, with gene therapy today, we're at the question of can we modify in vitro uh, fertilization and start programming our children. Uh, you can see 3D printing used for prosthetics, but also to print a gun. There are all sorts of dark side and light side, so we need to blend uh, the policy and the regulations to help things grow, but, not, uh, but have a mindset about where these are going to be. On the question to genomics uh, and cancer, uh, two quick things. Uh, we often treat diseases very, like they're the same. Type 2 diabetes is actually, can be defined at a genomic level. 
in, at Mount Sinai in New York, they analyzed the genomes of, I think, 2,000 type 2 diabetics and found at least three distinct subtypes who responded differently to diet, exercise, drugs. And so we're going to see the ability to subparse every individual because we'll soon be at a $100 genome. Everyone here will be sequenced, and hopefully we can share and collaborate with that information. On the cancer side, I'm an oncologist. We're starting to sequence every tumor and learn to find their genetic uh, uh, challenge areas, and we're starting to build cocktails of individualized drugs and immunotherapy to address cancer far more uh, humanely and more effectively than the sort of poison treatment we give to most patients today. So lots of excitement, lots of possibilities, but we need to pull the technology together. This the, the question of uh, chronic uh, treatment, containment of chronic illnesses, right? Mm. I, I think I'll give two examples, three examples. Uh, diabetes, hemophilia uh, are two good examples what's happening now. For cancer, we know that now across the board, across the board, the cure rate from combined surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, and targeted therapy. Five things. It's not only. It's about 60% five-year survival. What happened as a breakthrough in treatment of cancer is leukemia, treatment of leukemia. You see, destroy the leukemic cells by chemotherapy and radiotherapy and replace the marrow with hemopoietic stem cells. This is the most important application so far for stem cells. And uh, so the future is open, is wide, uh, needs research, experimentation, randomized trials, but, but I, I am sure many exciting things will happen in the not so future, in the not so far future. Thank you. أنا أعتذر عن أخذ مزيد من الأسئلة لضيق الوقت والإشارة رفع العلم الأحمر يعني خلاص شكرا جزيلا لضيوف الكرام على هذه النفحة الصحية في مجال المعرفة أتمنى أن تستمتعوا ببقية جلسات القمة وأتمنى لكم مستقبل صحي مشرق إن شاء الله شكرا لكم جزيلا ونلتقي بكم إن شاء الله شكرا